Welcome back to Garbeardia. Here with you with the next chapter, chapter 8 of the Bill Rider series. And in case you were wondering, chapter 9 is already almost completely written. So they should be coming out here mid-month, I would reckon, if all things hold steady. I'm also working on doing art for the hardback cover version of the, com the correctly done book one. And yeah, fun times ahead. However, our sponsors are Redcom One, now coming up with their new boba tea and sour gummy flavor powders for pre-workout, as well as uh, new red velvet MRE bars, more flavors for their protein shakes, pre-made and powder, the war games, all kinds of fun stuff going on Redcon One to help you get through your workouts and through your day. The other sponsor is Skull Splitter Dice. Here you can find all your D6, D8, D10, and D20 needs, as well as D100s and all kinds of fun sets like Necromancer's Bouquet, Steampunk Dice, Medusa's Glitter, that kind of stuff. And more or less, you can find a set of dice to fit your personal style and need. And Redcon 1 helps your body, Skull Splitter Dice helps the soul. Additionally, uh, last time the introduction for Aristic didn't quite go through, so here's that. Hey everyone, I'm Emerson, aka the Aristic Writer. Uh, this is just a short introduction on myself. I'm a chef and baker by day, an aspiring voice actor and fiction author by night, and just an all around nerd. I'm currently working on several projects, including a high fantasy book series, a tabletop RPG system set in the world of said series, the storyboard for a PC horror game that my nine year old daughter is making, and I'm currently writing scripts for a new YouTube channel based around world building for fiction writing, which will be up and running just as soon as I find someone to help with the avatar art. So keep an eye out for that. And with that out of the way, let's get on to chapter eight, bringing the heat. Yule squinted through his binoculars at the blurry, smudged line of the advancing army. They were still too far away to make out just who they were or what they were sporting in terms of firepower, but he had to assume it was local weaponry and nothing from the modern human era. These assumptions were grounded in the fact they were all marching in normal type formations, and little glints of light could be seen from the sun scattering across the numerous spear tips. He looked away from his binoculars and down the long trench line that the local druids managed to create for his division and the volunteer fighters from Tallweed. The trenches themselves bristled with rifles and machine guns, while behind it were stoves and half-tracks, all dug up to their guns and presenting only death and destruction to the enemy. Pumas and dingoes were positioned further back towards the edge of the city, their barrels protruding from windows, staying hidden behind wagons or crates filled with sand. The trench itself was only a few yards away from the buildings, as Yule didn't want too much dead space between the trench itself and the escape path into the city. The last thing he wanted was having to flee the trench for whatever reason, and being caught in the open between a large span of field and cover. The buildings themselves were also ringed with guns, as sniper and machine gun nests littered every rooftop that held a vantage point over the enemy approach. The tallest point, being the main tower of the small keep, had a radio team in it to broadcast information all over the city's defense points. To keep from getting pinned in and surrounded, Yule had set up his division in a modified wedge, fanning it out so the enemy couldn't surround and break into the city as easily as they thought they were able. This wedge held lightly seasoned troops and vehicles to stem the tide, while the crack troops and veterans all held the main part of the wedge to take the brunt of the enemy charge. If things really went to hell, the city was turned into a defensive nightmare. Dwarven made claymores stood ready to be completed with their trip lines staged to be finished on a retreat. Tank pits lay concealed with clever magical camouflages, making the spans above the empty hole look like neat stone or innocent looking flower gardens. Stalking these tank traps were Belcher teams, all of which sported anti-tank heat rounds in their delivery systems. Yule knew he had to hold tall wheat and let the enemy break upon it like the tide upon a rock. If he managed to cripple this Alterac main force, it would make Prince Nim's job easier of returning the locals to the side of the Vale Riders, then allow Yule to push south and crump whatever chosen children forces were nesting down there. 
He looked over his shoulder at a building just down the way and raised his hand. Alavara perked her head up and waved back, while the eyes of Makarat poked up over the rim of the large window. He prodded his radio operator on the shoulder, and the male Oni private handed him the receiver. Yule clicked a small module on the side of the talking piece. Olivara backed up from the window, and that goes for all of you. Find a position within the room itself and fire out from there. The space between the window and you may save your lives. Olivara gave Yule a thumbs up, then helped Makarot heft up their 240 Bravo machine gun. The brim touchstone long optic Daewoo K2 slung over her shoulder. He watched as many other windows did the same, the long barrels slinking back into the shadows. Yule leaned forward and clicked the broadcast preset to Gremlin's channel. Gremlin, how are we looking? Gremlin's voice piped up over the radio. He could hear Fino chattering over the radio near her. Looking good. Flanks just received their final supply of extra vehicles and most of them are dug in or camouflaged. Mortar teams are set up in the center of the city. Have them fire some test rounds at their longest preset. Two minute delay on the hang so I can warn everyone, Yule said. And when Gremlin confirmed, Yule toggled the preset back to the open channel. War Daddy to all units, be advised, mortars doing test drops, carry word down the chain, out. Yule handed his radio operator his receiver back inside. He knew there were proper call-outs for this kind of thing, but his memory of radio lingo and etiquette left much to be desired. Besides, he was pretty sure that anything he did know the locals wouldn't understand anyway, so to keep winging it was his game. His radio operator held a few fingers to a single earpiece as he listened and turned to Yule. Domino says Hoppies are ready to go for harassment duties. Yule nodded, and he only keyed on his receiver, relaying the go-ahead to Domino once the mortars were done test firing. Not soon after, the first shell landed, and Yule made a note of where it landed, then checked with the notepad he had in his pocket. When the dust had settled and Yule had called back to Gremlin to check in on a few things, he heard a loud whistling call echo out from the city. He looked up as every harpy brave enough to carry a grenade satchel began their harassment flights, and he heard a familiar shush of wings come down behind him. Yule turned and smiled at Chickily, while behind him, Eris landed down after, her legs bristling with hardware. Well, well, look who wanted to fly before doctor's orders. Chickily smiled smugly and held open his wings. Chickily fit to fly. All Harpy doing is dropping bombs. Can't miss out. Eris rolled her eyes. Chickily only carrying quarter load and bar of radio. Still count? Chickily hissed, and Eris clicked her fangs at him in annoyance. Yule just chuggled, then reached over and fixed Chickalee's rolled cuffs. Just be sure to be careful. Stay high and watch out for archers. Chickalee, no. Eris, make sure. Eris said, and bumped Chickalee with her hip. Chickalee whacked her with his wing, then took off at a run, gaining some speed before flapping away with Eris hot on his tail, screeching at him in agitated harpish. Salili came flying down the trench line in the opposite direction, rolling past Chickaly and Eris gracefully despite the satchel she wore. She would land here and there and dispense healing draughts or the living bandages to anyone who needed them, only to skirt low over the ground again to the next auxiliary trooper. Yule called over Yethis, who came over at a jog, and he nodded to her. Do you know any far side spells? Yethis tapped at her lip. Um, oh, I know one. I can make you see from a point of my choosing as long as I can see it. Does it take a lot of blood? Nope. Doesn't last very long, though. Maybe a few minutes? Yule hummed and looked into the binoculars again, and could barely make out the faraway speck of a cart that had been left due to a broken wheel. The broken cart was only 300 yards away from the advancing forces, which themselves Yule reckoned were maybe a mile away, possibly two. Yule gave Yethis a binoculars and led her eyes to the cart. Can you put me there? Sure, sure. Just give me a minute. Yethis replied, and set down the binoculars on the edge of the trench and pulled out a small knife she always used for these types of things. With a slice of the pointer finger, she began to cast her spell, rubbing the blood between the sliced finger and her thumb while staring back out with the binoculars. Yule braced himself for whatever was to come, but felt his eyes get heavy and sleepy for a moment. 
He blinked them, annoyed, but when he opened them, he found himself floating above the broken cart. He couldn't speak or move, but just hover in place and turn to see around him. It was as if he had been transformed into some kind of spy camera, and he cocked his head at the thought of it. He could hear Yethus giggling beside him despite being on the cart in the distance, and the feeling was discombobulating. He shook his non-visible head and blinked, looking around towards the uncoming army, and he felt around in his pockets for his patent pen. The army that the King of Alterach managed to scrum together was legion in size, and many of the soldiers that marched along were local elves, their glaives glittering in the sun and banners snapping in the breeze. They were also quite quick in their march step, and soon were striding by the cart in their columns. Yule couldn't help but be flabbergasted. What were they going to do? March straight into his guns? There weren't even any modern weapons in these front ranks, and it was as if they planned to fight a regular melee battle. Yule couldn't figure out how he managed it, but made himself rise higher above the cart, and he squinted as he spied orcs. These orcs were almost an entire tribe it seemed, hundreds of them marching along in a loose formation with the elves. Behind them were even more mercenaries, many of them more elves, orcs, and even spied a few hundred brim touch that trudged along. None of the mercenaries seemed very happy to be there, nor did the countless numbers of militia and levies that soon made an appearance. Even further behind them were chosen children regulars, the rifles slung across their chest. Others rode either on or in HMMVs and other light vehicles, all of which bore the bright blue letters UN across the hood. Sitting high and prideful on a Bradley was one of Nim's brothers, while another brother rode beside the track vehicle on an armored warhorse. Yule could feel the spell beginning to wind down, and quickly scribbled blindly into his notepad. He heard an odd noise, and looked up and around the same time the rest of the troopers did, and he watched a stick grenade tumble down and bounce off a of levy's helmet. Grenade! A chosen children lieutenant screamed, and the entire formation of the army scattered as if someone had poked a nest of daddy long legs. The grenades detonated, throwing dust and shrapnel through the air as people screamed, their flesh being marred by the small fragments of metal. Harpies swooped down at speed, dropping grenades and satchels of explosives where they saw fit, and the explosion soon ripped whatever it was they were on apart. The explosives' pins and cords were tied to the feet of the harpies, so when they were released from their claws, weight and gravity would do the rest. A male J-harpy performed a flash stall with his wings, coming to a stop two feet above an HMMV and showed with both of his feet, delivering two payloads of rapid deployment dwarven Simtex into the gunner hatch. The J Harpy zoomed away seconds before the explosives ripped the HMMV apart, scattering steel and body parts into any poor soul that was too close. The crackle and boom of gunfire responded to the Harpy attack, tracers hissing into the air after the airborne assailants. Yule recognized the screeching accent of Ceres' harpish, and soon the flight ducked down from the air, zipping down to ground level and scattering a few feet above the ground in their retreat. Yule washed on as some harpies were too slow, and a handful of Himalayas and Sparrow harpies crashed into the ground, being caught mid-dive by the tracing machine gun fire. Yule saw none that he recognized outright, but the mayhem in front of him kept him from looking too closely. Black fog began to ebb in around the edge of his vision, and he knew the spell was coming to a close. He raised up as far as he could to get a rough estimate of the army's total size, as well as watching the spreading retreat of the harassing harpies before the spell faded away, and his eyes felt tired once more. Yule gave another long blink, and when he opened his eyes, he was back in the trench beside Yethis, who was holding her hand to the small of his back and steadying him. In the distance, he could hear the clatter of machine guns and the remnants of the chaos he had left behind. Without delay, Yule got a hold of his radio operator and began relaying all the information he had garnered during his brief overview of the oncoming enemy force and the trench seemed to bristle as word slowly made its way down the private news network. 
Wolf and a few other human bell riders rolled up near Yule on a pair of motorbikes, and they hopped down into the trench. You think there's over 60,000? Hell, even the largest armies in our world were like 30,000 at the most. McCormick shouted, and two more R-75s roared past, making their way towards the outer flanks with more ammunition. Wolf took out his mugroot cigar and spat, then placed it back between his lips. They could be hoping to whittle us down and soak up ammunition with the chaff, then mop us up with the regulars. Would they really just throw people at us until we ran out of bullets? Quick aside, I just had a huge coughing fit, so my voice may sound jank. My apologies. I think I inhaled a bug. Yethis asked, her face aghast. Sure, right now we hold the defensive advantage. They have to either drop them in via the air on top of us, or try to overwhelm us with pure weight of body. I mean, the only way they could avoid that is just someone teleporting behind us. Yule began, but his voice drawled away as his face blanked. He was so used to conventional warfare that he had completely forgotten he was in a world with magic and spells. He slowly turned and looked towards the buildings behind them. If they could teleport 30,000 chaff troops right into the city behind us, Wolf continued, and he looked over his shoulder at the city as well. Then send in regulars right into our front with mechanized infantry. McCormick said aloud, and he pulled out a small pocket map that Gremlin had printed off for him with their precious ink supply. Yule pressed a finger down where their trench network was on the map and traced it towards the city. They could run it right down the middle and drive a wedge in between our two flanks, then swallow them whole when they create the pockets. Yule spun around to Yethis and placed a hand on her shoulder. Yethis, get me every war caster we have in this division, now. Yethis froze, blank faced as Yule gripped her shoulder, but her brain managed to reboot after only a second, and she grasped for Yule's radio operator. Within minutes, war casters came streaming in from all over the defense network via motorcycle, some sidecars even having two or three of the smaller races clinging to them for dear life as the drivers roared ahead at full speed. The chief warcaster Arenda Kane arrived last, jumping out of a dingo and rolling to her feet as the armored car sped past, and she dusted herself off briskly. Arenda was a dark yellow oni of the Singin Mountain Clan, and she could heft a battle axe as well as she could sling magic. She bore only one horn, a single elegant spike that shadowed her left eye, and she jogged the rest of the way towards Yule and the other warcasters. Even though she wore the full uniform of the Veil Rider Auxiliaries, she was rarely seen without the shock white prayer spheres of her clan, normally cross slung over her shoulder. Mr. Yule, apologies for my tardiness, Orinda said, and she jumped down into the trench with a thump of boots. The rest of the war casters tilted their heads in acknowledgement while Yethas waved cheerily from beside Yule. First Sergeant Kane, is there any way to stop a teleportation spell? We have an inkling they may try and jump half their army in behind us in the city. Yule said, and above the trench line, harpies zoomed over, returning in mass from the harassment attack. Chickley and Eris flew low and whistled at Yule, and he waved at them shortly. Orenda placed a finger to her pale yellow bottom whip and thought, eyebrows drawn together in concentration. She stared into nothing for a moment before looking back up to you, and she nodded once, finger unmoving. They would require a lot of blood, and I mean a lot of blood, to do what you think they're trying to do. At the same time, we know our enemy well, and I would not put it past them. I know a way to try and negate the range of which they can jump in and push it back, but I cannot purely negate it. Yule looked at McCormick and Wolf, and Wolf rested a hand idly on his peacemaker. Do you think you can put it out to about a hundred or so yards? Arenda looked over the war caches around her, finger never leaving her lip, and her amber green eyes looked back to Wolf. Perhaps. We can certainly try. Make it so, First Sergeant, Yule said, and he grabbed the receiver from his radio man. Be on guard for hostile movement via magical means, eyes wide and head swiveling. All vehicles make sure HE is loaded, war daddy out. Yule handed the receiver back to the Oni private, then turned back around, watching all the war casters hustle out of the trench line behind First Sergeant Kane as he spoke to Wolf and McCormick. 
Get Cheeky dead center on the line with his men, and have any half-tracks not already dug in lined up with their guns facing the trench approach. Make sure that if they manage to get past us, the light vehicles are ready to spin around and apply pressure to the city center. Get the lone wanderers running around and spaced out to help the auxiliaries, and tell Gremlin to get a bird or a harpy up to monitor their main camp. If they're within range of the Stoogs, I want to make sure they know just how far out we can touch them. Off you get. Wolf touched the tip of his cowboy hat, which was in need of a good wash and repair. Yes, sir. On it. McCormick answered, and the two went off at a trot. Yule then turned to Yethis. Yethis, how much blood is needed for that kind of transport? Yethis looked down at her two bloody fingers. I would say maybe eight or ten, Matram. Ten gallons of blood? Yule said incredulously, and he remembered the standard human body only held maybe two gallons of blood at the most. It takes a lot of blood and energy to cast a portal of that size, as I would assume they would have to craft it long and high enough for cavalry. They would also have to make it go as far as they can from wherever they are. Yethis mused, and both her and Yule's arm hairs began to prickle. They looked over at the small cluster of war casters and saw they were casting with bloody hands held aloft. Yeah, I get that, but isn't it a bit reckless to have that many people bleeding at once? Yule asked. Yethis winced. Yes, it is. Unless you go down a path that allows you to use only a few bodies for fewer casters. Would they do that? Yule said. And he gazed towards where he knew the enemy to be. He had to assume they had some kind of hiding spell up, as all he saw were heat waves. Yethis looked up at Yule, her hair braid catching a bit of the breeze and a few loose strands fluttering out. Would you? If it meant a quick and decisive victory? Yule pursed his lips sourly, but he didn't reply. He knew that such a sacrifice would lead to a very quick victory, and a small, dark part of him knew he would have been tempted all the same, just as the enemy general was. He didn't have long to ponder the thought as he felt a bubble-like shockwave pulse from behind him. He turned, and while he couldn't see the spell itself, he saw the grass move as if blown by a hard wind. The spell washed over him like a torrent, and he had to slap his patrol cap down with his hand to keep it from blowing away. Yethis gave a shiver as a spell passed over her, and Yule blew away the goosebumps from his arms. When he looked back up, he saw something even more peculiar, and his goosebumps came back with a vengeance. The contact of the two spells hitting each other was immense, but not visually. The boom that cascaded out in a shockwave sounded like two massive waves hitting each other, flattening the tall grass and even pushing away the clouds nearby in the sky. The boom washed over the trench line, throwing back the lost patrol caps at their owners who grabbed at them in a panic. Contact! Keep pushing! Arenda cried out, and both she and her fellow war catchers began to bleed themselves heavier, expelling torrents of power towards the spell they held. The other casters must have been shouting the same, as the two spells pushed against each other like two giants wrestling, each one vying for victory. Son of a bitch, they were going to jump behind us, Yule shouted, and he ranged where he could see most of the grass swishing around in the distance as the two spells fought against each other. Radio! His Oni radio operator was tight beside him, and offered Yule the receiver as he double-checked that his rifle was loaded pulling the bolt back slightly and checking for gleaming brass in the extractor. Yule pressed the actuator for the receiver. War Daddy to Iron Rain 1, adjust fire, over. The ears of the Valley Elf Specialist perked as she heard Yule's voice over the radio, and everyone looked over to her from their mortar holes as she spoke. Iron Rain to War Daddy, send it. Preset grid 3, 200 yards, danger close. Now everyone was perked up, and the Yamatu private in the same hole with her looked worried. Lori, did he say 200 yards? Yeah. Lori said breathlessly, and she turned to the other mortar teams. Preset grid 3, 200 yards! The other mortar teams shifted their tubes around to face the main trench line, while other members of the team began to prep their rounds. War Daddy to Iron Rain, 
One gun, H-E, fire for effect. Iron rain to War Daddy. One gun, H-E, fire for effect. Lori turned to the mortar team next to her. One round, H-E, hang it. The mortar team member hung one of the rounds in his shaking hands above the tube. This was his first round fired in anger since training, and even the tips of his brim-touched horns were jittering with his nerves. Fuck! Hey! Pull that fucking pin out! Lori shouted, and the brim-touched private quickly pulled the safety pin out of the mortar round and threw it over his shoulder. Hang it! Fire! The brim-touched private dropped the round in the tube, then ducked his head next to it. The thunderous crack of the round leaving the tube made everyone duck their heads as it left. Specialist Lori placed the receiver of her radio to her ear. Shot over? Shot out, Yule replied, his voice distorted and crackly by heavy amounts of wind hitting the receiver. The Yamatu private next to Lori looked around at the sky. Why is it so windy over there? Don't know, but the distance is super close for what we thought it would be. Lori keyed the receiver. Splash over. Yule's voice once again filled her ears. Splash out. Everyone in the mortar battery waited for the distant thump of the round, and they all smiled when it was heard a few moments later. Immediately, Yule's voice was now far louder in her ear, and Lori almost jumped in shock. Right 20, all guns 10 rounds, HG e. fire for effect. Yule's voice was almost drowned out by the sounds of nearby machine gun fire and the report of stew cannons, but Lori could still make out the words. Right 20, everyone, 10 rounds, H-E, fire, fire, fire! Lori screamed, and the Yamatu private beside her ripped out a preset mortar round and slammed dunked it into the tube. The mortar battery cracked and boomed as they sent their shells towards the main trench defense, and they worked feverishly. Dropping mortar rounds in the tube scant seconds after the previous round had left. Iron rain to War Daddy. Splash in five. Splash over. Add five more rounds HE and fire for effect, Yule barked, and emptied an entire magazine towards the line of infantry charging at them. As soon as the first mortar round had impacted, the spell slingers casting the teleportation spell set their range and opened a portal as wide as a football field. No one hesitated to open fire along the trench line, and a wall of lead met the oncoming figures. There were so many violet tracer rounds zipping through the air that Yule was dazzled for a moment before recovering himself. Stoogs and short-barreled pumas let loose explosive shells into the rushing infantry, blowing bodies and their missing parts across the other charging figures as if they were macabre party poppers. As they fired their main guns, their coaxial machine guns burped and sputtered, tearing the air with strings of bullets. Bodies fell in droves before the wall of lead, and those behind them either fell to around themselves or simply fell over the bodies and became tangled in the heap. The wall of infantry made a small leap of progress towards the trench line, but were then hewn to ruin by the deadly arrival of the 81mm mortar shells amongst the ranks. Soldiers disappeared in a cloud of red dust as the payload detonated on top of them, while others were shredded to mere hunks of meat by the shrapnel. Those lucky enough to not die from the shockwave found themselves instead studded with hunks of metal from the armor of their fellow infantry or fell to the ground with shards of bone lodged into their own bodies. The cascade of mortar fire brought the charge to a murderous halt, and within minutes not a single soldier of the first wave stood standing among the corpse-laden approach to the trench. A call for a ceasefire echoed down the Cosmoline Company lines, and the gunfire rippled down to nothing. A few more mortar rounds fell to throw more bodies through the air and shower anything still living with viscera but nothing else stirred in front of the open, shimmering portal. Yule grabbed the receiver from his radio operator and exhaled out his nose. War Daddy to Iron Rain, mission over, but stand by for repeat. Standing by. He heard back, and he handed the receiver to the Oni. Beside him, Yethus was loading a fresh magazine into her own Debu K2, and she shook her head. That must have been a couple thousand right there. She breathed and jumped when First Sergeant Arenda came down in between Yule and herself. Arenda pulled out her own binoculars and surveyed the ruined line of infantry. Yule, we have stopped it there, but we can't take it down. That is going to have to do for now, Yule said, 
but didn't have much time to say anything else as the portal gave another soft glow. Next wave! Yule cried out, and dozens of rifles came back over the lip of the trench. Yule steeled himself, but what came out next caused his jaw to drop. Yule had heard and read of golems, constructs of magical forces that held together metal or shaped earth, but to see a whole line of them walk through the portal holding massive shields aloft gave him pause. Holy shit, Yule gasped out, and Yethus blanched beside him. Siege golems! Yethus murmured, and Arenda nodded. These are not just siege golems, but city breakers. These toys don't go back in the box when they're done, but are always running and ready to play. How did I not see those? Yule guffawed, and picked up the receiver, shouting at the motors to open fire at the same time the Stugs let forth a barrage of their own shells. The high-explosive payloads erupted upon the shields, causing the golems to stagger backwards in alarm. Yule squinted as he saw this, and could even see that the golems reacted with intelligence, looking to each other, unsure. Whack, Yule murmured, and began firing his rifle at the infantry who swarmed behind the golems. The trench line came back to life with gunfire, as well as the buildings behind them. Aim for the eyes, Chick stated flatly, looking through her optic at the bright glowing eye of the siege golem. Beside her, Alavara and Makarat were reloading the 240 Bravo, and Alavara racked the charging handle backwards as Makarat pulled out her own scope Dewu K2, and she crept up onto a desk beside Chick's. Chick's rifle barked out a round that smashed into the eye of the golem attempting to shield off the motor rounds, and the giant construction roared in frustration. The golems, to her, resembled giant suits of walking armor with glowing white hot metal underneath, and they would have looked regal if they weren't currently being pounded with 75mm high explosive rounds and 81mm mortar shells. Olivara held down the hammer on her 240 Bravo, stitching a line of lead across anything that dared poke past the golems. Her crimson hair braid frayed out with sweat and fingers already stained black by carbon. Makarat pulled up her Daewoo K2 and peered through the human-made optic, looking for a place to arrest the chevron sight. Well, as you said, nice for now. Chicks murmured, and worked the bolt on her Seiko custom sniper rifle, the brass casing tinkling to the ground. Below their window, an M2 was thudding out his anger to the oncoming infantry, but went quiet as the crew dove for cover. A fireball had been launched from the oncoming second wave, and the magical munition crashed against the building, throwing magical flames and heat up from the floor below. A friendly warcaster saw this, and quickly splashed the building with water, putting out the flames. Magic casters! Chick said, and she swung her barrel to and fro, trying to find whatever had sent the fireball. I see them, little bunch of them near the fourth column from the right. Makarat piped, and fired around in that direction. Alavar swung her 240 Bravo around and began firing where Makarat had stated, emptying the entire belt in order to suppress the warcasters. A little far away to be casting magic, aren't they? Olivar said as she rushed over and grabbed another ammo can for her machine gun. Chick squinted into her glass and traced her reticle across a small group, currently hiding behind a makeshift wall of bodies and dropped shields. She steadied her breath and exhaled out through her nose as she spied what she believed to be the leader of the group. She was a tall and proud female elf that had small braids tied into a ponytail at the rear of her head, and the elf stood up quickly, launching another fireball towards the trench line. Chicks waited, the small dot of her MOAR reticle resting in between the elf's eyes. Chicks was able to notice that her eyes were a lovely shade of amber, and that she had done her makeup before the battle, her eyes bearing soft and pleasant wings of black. Her eye shadow went from black to crimson as Chick's bullet plunged into her skull, just slightly to the right of her nose bridge, and the elf slumped down like a rag doll. Chick's exhaled and worked the bolt of her Seiko, while beside her, Makarat squeezed the trigger at regular intervals, chasing her target before finally getting around to land home. Alavara had her 240 Bavo reloaded and began to belt down more of her own tracers into the infantry, who were now only a hundred yards away from the trench in its unrelenting gunfire. 
Yule crouched beside a stoog with his radio operator, but his hand held the assault gun's outboard communication receiver to his head. I want you to aim for his legs, right at the kneecap, Yule shouted, and he watched the barrel traverse to the left and then down. Sending it, the dwarf tank commander said back, and the barrel recoiled harshly as the round left. Yule watched it via the guide tracer, and the round ripped the construct's leg apart, impacting just above the knee and detonating. The golem roared in defiance and came down on its working knee, using the nub of his other leg to stabilize. The other stooks caught on quickly from a brief radio call, and after a matter of seconds all the golems were now shattered below the knees, and had to hold their buckled and pockmarked shields in front of themselves to keep their infantry safe. Yule hung up the stew's receiver and then picked up his radio operators, calling out for another fire mission. There was, however, no reply, and Yule checked the receiver for damage. When none was found, he keyed the receiver again. War Daddy to Iron Rain 1, how copy? There was no reply for a few heartbeats until she finally activated her own receiver. He heard the report and crack of rifles along with the screaming of someone nearby, then the voice of Specialist Lori. Lori screamed into the receiver as she hip-fired her debut K2, spraying down a trio of charging Alterac infantry. The bolt of her rifle locked to the rear on the empty magazine and she cursed, throwing the receiver away. Shit! Come and get some of me, you fucking dogs! Specialist Lori slapped in a fresh magazine and affixed her bayonet as the rest of the mortar crews fell back and away from their mortar holes, grabbing cover wherever they could and blasting away with their rifles all the while. An arrow impacted her left shoulder and Lori grunted as the head dug into her flesh. She turned, spying the errant little archer knocking another arrow, and she sprayed him down with 556. She snapped away the majority of the arrow shaft with a howl of pain, and dove down with the rest of her battery near a gathering of equipment filled crates. A large male Oni Private First Class pulled out two grenades and ripped away the fuse cords with his teeth hucking the two grenades over the crate he was behind nonchalantly. The Yamatu private she was sharing duties with rounded around the edge of his own crate, sporting one of the newer Angridol MP5s. Private Pomp had been feverishly ingesting any kind of human pop culture he could get from Gremlin, and made a point to always come to movie nights when they were on. He was also well versed in the more colorful aspects of the English language, and he did not see it fitting to waste an opportunity using it. You cock sucking fucks! He roared in English and let loose the MP5 on full auto, hosing down anything within sight with a string of 9mm. He managed to fell six men before having to duck back behind the crate to avoid arrow fire, as well as reload. There was a pop and crack of rifle fire back at them, and Lori poked her head over the lip of her crate. Chosen children. Pomp growled as he slapped the charging handle of a submachine gun. Fay cock suckers. The only private first class leaned forward. What suckers? Shut up! We need to get the tubes up! Lori shouted, and looked around the lower edge of her crate. Many of the battery had been killed in the surprise attack but more dead Alterac infantry lured the mortar holes than Cosblink Company auxiliaries. Most of their casualties came from those who were near the road, fetching crates of ammunition. Lori breathed in and out of her nose rapidly as she thought, and looked around the scatterings of privates around her. She looked back out and saw that Sergeant Primary Raccoon was lying dead in his mortar hole, having been stabbed in the back during the surprise attack. The brim touched having one of the victims of the sudden assault, the whole platoon of infantry having come out of nowhere and charging them. She saw that the rest of the Alterac infantry were scooping up the rifles of the dead as well as extras nearby, and were taking up positions to keep Iron Rain pinned where they were. Lori had no idea how many of her battery were left alive, but she needed to get her mortars up and running, or else the entire front trench may be lost. Okay. Okay. Gabri, come here. Lori said, and motioned the Valley of Private First Class to her. Galbury Crouch ran towards her, bullets skipping up the tops of their crate cover as the other troopers returned fire, and his bright green eyes stared into hers. What's up? 
Lori winced as she leaned up, looking over the top of her crate again. We're going to get back on our tubes and leave a few people here to pin down those southern elves. I want you to take a crew, and I want Jigri to take a crew, and get to those tubes over there! She gestured towards the nearest mortar holes, those being devoid of any body obstructions. Everyone else here is going to make sure we don't get shot. Or try anyway. Jigri! Jigri, the large male Oni private first class who had been throwing grenades, turned his blue head towards her, wide eyes gleaming. I heard. Albron, Torin, Metu, you're with me. The crews bundled up, ready to spring into their runs for the mortars, and Lori braced herself against the crate. Ready? Covering fire! Go, go, go! Those staying behind popped out of their cover, firing on full auto at anything on the other side while the mortar crew sprinted, hunched over and zigzagging to present harder targets. Jigri caught her round to the leg, but was able to tumble inside his mortar hole with a curse, while everyone else made it inside okay. The mortar teams ducked and weaved as they recalibrated their mortars, yelling at them in Dwarvish so the gremlins inside the devices fine-tuned themselves. Lori pulled up her rifle, checking the magazine before calling out the order. Covering fire! Hang it! Lori, two riflemen from the other occupied mortar holes, and their covering auxiliaries fired at their enemies who also dove back down for cover, allowing the mortar teams to hang their round. Fire! The mortar tubes cracked and boomed as their rounds were discharged, and one crewman took a round to the chest, falling down in the heap in Galbraith's mortar hole. Angry tears of frustration stung at Lori's eyes as she readied herself again. Covering fire! Hang it! Fire! The process was repeated, and one of the chosen children's saboteurs rounded his cover despite the incoming fire, putting down another mortar team member and putting a bullet in one of Lori's own. Lori cursed and knelt beside the brim touched, his eyes wide with panic as he coughed up a spray of blood. I'm hit! Oh, Rodos, I'm fucking hit! He cried out, holding his hand to the slowly pooling gunshot wound to his left lung. Shit! Shit! Lori yelled, pulling out her personal infantry medical pouch and scattering the contents in her haste. She found the small living bandage and pressed it against the wound. She heard a noise behind her and grabbed her rifle one-handed, hefting it up and filling the chest of an Alterac infantryman with multiple copper jackets. The Alterac soldier's chest ripped open, the steel breastplate clanking noisily as the rounds punched through the back plate, and he fell limply into the mortar hole, rolling against Lori's legs. Covering fire! Hang it! She heard the report of rifles. All of the mortar teams got a round off, even hers, and the wounded brim touch private grabbed at her arm, panic alight in his eyes. Lord, don't let me die here. Don't let me die in this hole. More blood was beginning to pool down the edge of his mouth, and Lori was at a loss of what to do. More tears beaded her eyes as she held the feeding bandage on his wound. I'm not, I'm not going anywhere. Just try to stay calm. <coughs> They got my lung, Lori. They got my lung. We need to find a medic. He said, and she could see that the wound now had an exit on the other side of his body and was bleeding profusely. Lori knew full well their medic was dead beside Sergeant Primary Rokun, having spotted the Yamatu female specialist slumped in the same mortar hole. She pulled out another living bandage and placed it on the exit wound. I know. I'm going to find one. Just hang on. Lori! Galbraith called out. Lori, we're out of rounds! Specialist Lori screwed her eyes shut, as she knew the extra rounds were over by the enemy, surrounded by dead auxiliaries who had been caught in the opening of the ambush. Shit! Shit! She cried out, and the brim touch prophet below her grabbed her arm again. He was too afraid to speak, but she saw the question in his soft sky blue eyes. Are we all going to die? Lori grabbed the wounded trooper's hand, pressed it to his wound, and reached around in her own personal dump pouch, her fingers fumbling around inside for a small healing drought. She found it and dumped it down his throat in the hopes it would buy him time. Behind her, another one of her crewmen was praying by gunfire, a female valley of private first class who fell backwards into the mortar, knocking it down and falling over her rifle. Amali! Lori cried out. But the Valley Elf quickly rebounded into a low kneel. I got it! I'm good! Fuck, it hurts though! 
Amali said, coughing harshly as she leaned up and let loose a few rounds of their slowly encroaching enemies. A grenade tumbled down into the mortar hole and Lori screeched, grabbing the small ball and chucking it back towards their enemies. The grenade went off with a few screams trailing after it, but she heard a detonation in the mortar hole next to them. Galbraith? Galbraith! Lori cried out, but nothing came back from Galbraith's mortar team. Lori began to cry, not in despair, but in anger at their situation as she grabbed her rifle. Amali sidled up next to her, popping up every second or so to fire at where she thought someone may be. While on the other side, Jigri caught a grenade midair and threw it back to elicit another explosion and more screams. Lori looked up and saw that more Alterac soldiers were running down the street towards them, having broken through somewhere, and Amali looked at her. Is this it? She said, and slapped a new magazine into her Debu K2. Lori breathed in harshly, pulling up her rifle and slotting a chosen child who had been prepping another grenade. I think it is. I think this is it. The grenade went off, killing a few more chosen children who were not quick enough. Shame. Amali said with a smile and a shake of her head as she reloaded again, and Lori gave a sad laugh. They had both enjoyed that human movie. It was a funny... what do the humans call it? Buddy cop adventure. Lots of shooting and witty banter that they couldn't help but quote at inappropriate times. Amelie nodded at her shoulder, the broken arrow shaft still poking out from it. What was it like getting stabbed? It was the single most painful experience in my life. Lori answered and prepped a dwarven grenade, having spied it sitting in the mortar hole in a little corner. What's the second most painful? Amelie replied, and they both shared a miserable chuckle as Lori chucked the grenade. It exploded and only spared them one less rifle their direction, and Amalia fixed her bayonet. It's been fun, Lori. Amalie said, and her face was now grim, no touch of humor to it. Definitely an adventure beyond the bakery heavens. Lori said with a small smile, and the two got ready to stand as they could hear the thudding of the enemy platoon's boots getting louder. Jigri, get ready! Lori called out and brought her rifle up at a low ready. Try to keep up with my blue ass knife here. Jigri called back, and Lori could just barely hear the laughter from Jigri's mortar hole. Lori cocked her thighs, but as she went to stand and shout out the order of the charge, two things happened at once that she did not expect. First, the building across the way exploded outwards, showering the street and some nearby Alterac infantry with broken glass and bricks. Second, a half-track barreled its way through the building right after the explosion of mortar, the track shrieking on the cobblestone road the driver hit the brakes. The MG3 machine gun on the front pentel cackled madly as the gunner raked it back and forth in the flank of their attackers, while humans began spilling over the sides of the half-track in colorful floral shirts, their own rifles cracking as they picked their targets. Lori then recognized Sergeant Major Wolf out in front of them, Peacemaker glinting as he fanned his hammer, cutting down five chosen children in quick succession and pistol whipping another. The flanking attack was swift and murderous, with no enemy left alive or breathing at the end of it. A short-barreled puma roared up behind and around the half-track, the turret and top deck covered in more auxiliaries. Lori and Amelie stood up slowly, as did everyone else, and she took stock of what was left of her battery. She saw that she was the highest rank left, and that out of the 50 they did have, only 19 remained, and her shoulders slumped. She looked over at the humans and the oncoming auxiliaries, and she held up a hand. Medic! And that's the end of chapter 8. Chapter 9, like I said, should be done hopefully before, you know, like mid-month, before end of the month I'm, I'm trying to get. But anyway, if you like these stories and others like them, be sure to like and subscribe to the channel of Garbeardia. Click the bell icon, watch for the videos, join the Discord server when there's a link on. Get in here, it's fun times. Now the majority of the income for this channel is from donations and book sales. So if you wish to actually support the channel, because I know you all use ad blockers probably, I don't blame you. 
If you can, drop a dollar in the coffee. Helps pay for stuff. Keep the channel running. Keep me writing full time. Help pay for the voice actors. If you have a voice actor you like in particular, you can put in a coffee donation just for them with their name in the descriptor, and I'll send it to them 100%. I'll take no Martian of it. Vanihu, thanks for showing up. Thanks for reading. Thanks for commenting as well. I do love my comments. It's more or less why I do this for that sweet comment dopamine rush. And until I see you next time on this side of the veil, this has been Garbro. That's Aristic. That's Cora. That's the Bell Dam. And this is Garbeardia. <laughs>